My name is Glenn Markowitz. I'm going to try to answer three questions in 10 minutes. One is who's getting autopsy at Columbia. The second is what can the autopsy service do for you? And third is what is happening in the kidneys, which is my organ of interest. I, I would just like to start by saying I've never been um, so proud or so grateful to be at Columbia. And I think that the, really the title of all this session today for our standpoint is what can anatomic pathology do to chip in? and to help with this pandemic. And I think the answer is we can give you some insights on disease and we can create the most ro robust uh, tissue bank possible. So now my slides just have to admit, here we go. So first the question is who's getting autopsy at Columbia? And uh, some of the cases are brain only, but in terms of the full body autopsies, as of today, we've done 39 COVID 19 autopsies. And I can give you the demographics of the first 34, where the mean age was 71 years. There was only one patient under the age of 50, and that patient was a solid organ transplant. The majority of the patients are between 53 and 79 years of age, and the patient's ages uh, are, extend all the way up to 93 years of age. We've autopsied 24 male and 10 female patients thus far. In terms of uh, a little bit about their medical histories, this is a really generally a group that doesn't have a lot of baseline kidney disease or frankly doesn't have a terribly complex medical history a lot of them uh, typically they do have some hypertension and by history 30 out of 33 had a history of hypertension about half had diabetes reviewing epic about a quarter have documented coronary artery disease and again these are not the demographics of who's dying of covid-19 this is the demographic of who's getting autopsied at columbia and obesity was not particularly prevalent among our autopsies, only about a quarter of patients. And you can see here the BMIs, and actually only two of the patients have BMIs over 40, and a little bit of additional medical history is provided at the bottom, five with prostate cancer, six with dementia, et cetera. Um, in terms of their duration of time at Columbia when they autopsied, and so five of these patients actually had, were deceased upon arrival in the emergency room, could not be revived. Um, another six of them died within 24 hours of arrival and three more within the first two days. So 14 had expired within the first two days. Um, and then you can see they extend upwards of 30 days in hospital to the time of dying. The last line here, there are eight patients who survived in the hospital more than 15 days and that's their actual length of stay. So what can the autopsy service for you, do for you? I think we could do three things. We can provide diagnoses that inform treatment and for that reason, we've really uh, really turned over the whole department about five weeks ago, four or five weeks ago. And we put all resources towards the autopsy service. We reassigned every level of staff to work on this. We're, we're increasing turnaround time. We really want to give the clinicians information that they can inform future decisions. So we can provide diagnoses that inform treatment. We can provide diagnoses that provide insights into pathomechanism and we can create a really robust tissue bank to enable future research. Um, the first, first 15 autopsies were before really we started improving things. And, and as a general rule, if you're going to do best possible research and you're going to ensure RNA and protein integrity, you really wanna get cases with a short post-mortem interval. And so optimal is less than six hours, six to 12 hours, you can still do a lot of studies you can still do a fair number of things at further time points, but it declines over time. And so our first 15 autopsies, we only had one under six hours, and really most of them were two days or more between the time of death and the time of autopsy. And then all of a sudden, a great synergistic um, process began, and the Department of Medicine got uh, very much involved. Big thanks to Ira Tavis, Emily Sai, and Don Landry. Big thanks to Jim Goldman and Pathology, who um, now chairs the tissue uh, committee for the Columbia University Biobank. And, but really putting all this together, we suddenly turned things around and the next 19 posts, and we've probably gotten these 19 over substantially less time than the original 15. We have eight here that are less than six hours. So at this point, we have 10 posts that are less than 12 hours post-mortem interval. You can see here the full duration of time. Again, really great, uh, great assist and great collaboration. So we're very grateful. Um, so I'll move now, lastly, to, to my organ of interest, the kidneys, and what is happening in the kidneys. So just briefly, um, of these patients, there were nine that we had documented normal creatinines. There were five that had known chronic kidney disease, 
and two are dialysis patients, but that means that I don't have a baseline creatinine for 18. And I think that's actually representative of a lot of the COVID patients we're seeing at Columbia is that we're seeing patients who weren't necessarily seen here before. And so one of the things that's really important here is to uh, define the acute kidney injury or what we used to call acute renal failure. And so we're using here the standard KDGO guidelines and I'll be applying them in this next slide. And so here's how the patients fall out. We have one patient, only one patient who did not develop any renal failure in the, hos in the hospital. We had six patients who developed AKI stage one, which is, you know, it's pretty soft criteria. You only have to have a creatinine increase of 0.3. But CKD stage two, which requires at least doubling of creatinine, and CKD stage three are quite a few patients. This is 16 out of these 23, and you can see 22 out of 23 bump in creatinine. The other patients here were two with stable chronic kidney disease who did not really develop AKI, the two dialysis patients, and we never were obviously able to obtain creatinine for the five who were deceased upon arrival. I, I should mention that what allows us so, in some ways to classify the CKD here is that while we don't have baseline creatinines, what we do have is tissue. So if we look at the tissue and we can really see there's very little chronic scarring, then that allows us to, to really estimate what the baseline real function would have been. And so someone who presents with a creatinine of three and no real scarring, you can assume that the, norm, the creatinine was normal at baseline. Um, in terms of the pathology, glomeruli, you know, we saw diabetic glomerulosclerosis in six of the autopsies, and that's about half of the patients who had a history of diabetes. We saw five in thrombi and only three out of the 27 uh, posts that now I'm talking here about, I've reviewed 29 at the time I created this slide, and I'm not counting the two with end-stage kidney disease. So we only saw five in thrombi, despite the fact that thrombosis is such a big issue, we only saw five in thrombi in three cases, and in every case, these were focal five in thrombi. We did not see a case with diffuse thrombosis. Um, and we generally saw kidneys that despite the patient's age, remember the mean age is 71 years, that the degree of glomerulosclerosis was less than 25% and 85%, which is very much consistent with the age of these patients. Um, do we see a lot of interstitial inflammation? The answer is no, this is not a viral interstitial nephritis. Uh, do we see viral inclusion? We do not see them either. And in fact, again, these were great kidneys at baseline. The degree of chronic scarring, tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis was less than 25% in almost 90% of patients. What we did see in 100% of them was significant vascular disease, which you can see either with hypertension or aging, and they would meet both of those criteria. Um, a big problem here, as I mentioned, is that that long post-mortem interval means that the tissue rapidly disintegrates. And because of the high enzyme content of proximal tubules, uh, the kidney actually has that autolysis or disintegration more than any other organ. And so autolysis was a big hindrance in the kidney. It will be less so in organs like the heart and lung. It was a big kidney, big issue in the kidney in 41% of these cases, sort of a moderate issue in 15%, but not a big issue in, in, a, in the largest chunk. And the real question is, in the 16 patients who had AKI stage two or three, and those are the 16 patients who at least doubled their creatinine in the hospital, what did we find? We found acute tubular injury, which was mild in the majority, sometimes more moderate to severe, or could not be assessed due to autolysis. And so despite, you know, it's interesting that despite profound degrees of renal dysfunction, many of them really only had very mild tubular injury, and I'll show you some pictures. And then the real question that everyone wants to know, is SARS-CoV-2 present in the renal parenchyma? And the answer there is like yes, and likely in very small amounts. What we have um, would suggest very small amounts. So some pictures, this quickly is a normal kidney, tubules back to back with one another. Here's glomeruli. This are one glomeruli. minute mark. I'm sorry? Well, one minute mark. I may need a little more than that, but briefly, this is normal. Um, this is what autolysis looks like. You see you lose all cellular elements. This is mild tubular injury in a patient whose creatinine went from 1.1 to 1.6, but this is mild tubular injury in someone whose creatinine hit nine. And now here is a case of really more severe ATN with widespread and impressive tubular simplification and vascularization. This patient more than tripled their creatinine. And here's another patient whose creatinine more than tripled AKI stage three, and this was probably the most severe ATN we saw in any case. Um, I told you these patients have a lot of background vascular disease, and these are those hypertensive and aging changes. I mentioned that some of them have nodular diabetic glomerulosclerosis, as you see here. 
Um, five and thromba I mentioned, and here's a glomerulus and a second glomerulus with a five and thrombus. Here's a vascular five and thrombus, and here's one entering a glomerulus. So we did see five and thrombi, and in one case, we even saw a little microinfarction, and you can see the neutrophils coming in to clean up the cellular debris. This is my last slide, and this is sort of the conclusions from the kidney. The main finding in the kidney is acute kidney injury, which is often quite mild as compared to the degree of, of creatinine elevation. And importantly, this suggests a pathogenesis that involves hemodynamic factors or cytokine effects or some combination. It is not a viral nephropathy. It is not a thrombotic microangiopathy, and it is not a, an acute glomerulonephritis. It is something that occurs in older patients with a background changes of vascular disease and sometimes diabetes too. And I think the most important thing I can say is that the absence of significant findings may be the most significant finding in the kidney. Thank you. Um...